Okay. Um, so it is 1130 now. And uh, I want to welcome everybody to, um, to our meeting. I'm Marianne Horn, the Community Outreach Strategist at Metro Plan Orlando, and I will be your host today. Uh, thank you for attending our first ever lunchtime virtual public meeting to discuss the Transportation Improvement Program, the TIP, our five-year work program for the region. We're glad you're here. Um, this Zoom meeting is accessible to the public uh, via computer, tablet, phone. Also, the video recording will be available later on the Metro Plan Orlando YouTube channel. So you can rewatch, you can share with friends. You will find links um, in the chat box to the U YouTube live stream and to the draft transportation improvement program itself. We'll be posting those in the chat box, which is at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So for this meeting, we have uh, just a few guidelines that will help things flow smoothly. Um, our members of the public who want to ask a question, you can use the, that Q&A button also located at the bottom of your toolbar. You can ask questions throughout the program. We will answer as many questions as possible during our question and answer session, which comes near the end. We will also set aside time for public comments at the very end where you can share your thoughts within a two minute time limit. Um, and now I would like to introduce you to some of our staff starting at the top. I'm going to turn the mic over to Metro Plan Orlando Executive Director, Mr. Gary Hutman to say just a few, just a few words before we start, Gary. Thanks, Marianne. I also wanted to let you all know how glad we are that you've decided to spend your lunch hour or hour and a half with us today. You know, transportation affects us all, whether we're residents, whether we work in the area, whether we're a visitor to the community. We all have places to go and, and uh, people we want to see, and we all want to make those trips efficiently and seamlessly. Uh, at Metro Plan Orlando, we work very hard to coordinate with our local transportation planners and local government staff members to plan how the transportation system should grow and how new connections should be made. And uh, at Metro Plan, we have a lot of smart uh, and dedicated people on staff, and you're going to hear from many of them uh, today. One of the most important factors, though, in our planning work is listening to the public. We can only plan transportation that meets your needs when we hear your ideas and, and listen to your opinions. And we do value those. And I can assure you that our board of directors does as well. We've had excellent uh, public involvement in our virtual programs during this past pandemic year. And we wanna build on that success. And I hope you'll all learn a lot about our five-year plan today, but please also consider contributing your thoughts to the official record by either making a comment at the end of this meeting or by emailing us. And we'll show you how to do that in just a few minutes. So again, thanks for spending some time with us uh, today. We, we really appreciate your participation. Marianne. Thanks, Gary. Our main presenter today will be Mr. Keith Caskey, who will give an overview of our transportation improvement program and talk to you about some of the upcoming road projects. Then Ms. Taylor Laurent will tell us about projects that we call complete streets, which means that they focus on making our roads accessible to all users. Next, Ms. Jasmine Blaze will tell us about some projects of particular interest to cyclists and pedestrians. We'll hear from Mr. Eric Hill and Ms. Uh, Laura Bauk on our transportation system maintenance and operations projects. Ms. Sarah Larson will talk about future transit projects, and Mr. Mike Wilson will wrap up with some of our safety initiatives. We also have several panelists from our partner agencies around the region who will be available to answer more in-depth questions about their areas during the Q&A. Now, um, just a little bit about who we are and what our role is in Central Florida transportation. 
Metro Plan Orlando is a metropolitan planning organization leading transportation planning in Orange, Osceola, and Seminole counties. We are a team of transportation planners, communications and finance professionals. We coordinate with elected officials and industry experts and the community, that's you, to shape a system that offers travel options. We set priorities and determine how federal and state transportation dollars are spent in the region. So before I turn it over to Keith Kasky to tell you more about the Transportation Improvement Program, here is a short video that sort of lays out how the process works. Have you ever wondered how transportation projects come to life? All projects in our 20-year plan get put on a waiting list for funding called the Prioritized Project List. It can take years or even decades to get out of the gate. Major transportation projects have big price tags. Funding these projects can be complicated and usually involves a combination of federal, state, and local money. We work on a project in phases. Each phase appears in our five-year plan as it's funded, and this is great news. Once a project appears in the Transportation Improvement Program, it's making progress. Let's take a look at two types of projects major roads, like state highway projects, and big public transportation projects, like bus rapid transit or rail. Both types begin on a similar path. First, we decide what kind of project will meet the identified need. Next, an in-depth planning study is done to look at all the available options for how the road will be built or what type of transit technology will be used. The public has opportunities to provide input and environmental impacts are also considered. At the end of this phase, one option is chosen. After this, road projects and public transportation projects go in different directions. A road gets designed, any necessary right-of-way gets acquired, and then construction can begin. These phases often take years. For a big public transportation project needing money from the U.S. government, the Federal Transit Administration must grant permission to begin the first phase, project development. After that, a public transportation project can move to the next phase, final design. Then, it's on to construction and operation. Want to learn more about Central Florida projects? Take a look at our five-year transportation improvement program. Okay, now we will hear from Mr. Keith Kasky. Okay, thank you, Mary Ann. Um, just what, as a follow up to the video, I just wanted to start off with a brief overview of the TIP for those of you that are not uh, familiar with this process. And uh, the, the purpose of the TIP is to identify all the transportation projects that are uh, funded in our region over the next five years with federal or state funds. So any uh, federal or state funded transportation project has to be included in the TIP. And this is one of the main documents that uh, we as an MPO are responsible uh, for. And then uh, we have the option to include locally funded projects uh, for information purposes in our TIP. And uh, we've always done that since those are important projects as well. And then the TIP is updated on an annual basis. So uh, we'll be back about this time next year with the review of another new TIP. Uh, next slide, please. Now this slide shows the amount of federal and state funds programmed over the five years of the TIP. And this is broken out by the uh, main categories of projects in the document. And all of these federal and state funded transportation projects have to be approved by the Metro Plan Orlando Board to be included in our TIP in order for these projects to move forward and be implemented. And as you can see down at the bottom, uh, this amounts to a total of more than $3 billion worth of projects. And I wanted to just briefly review uh, each of these project categories. Uh, starting at the top, the uh, first category on there are the, are the highway projects that are receiving federal and state funds. And uh, so these are projects that are mainly on roads that are on the state road system. So these would 
uh, include projects on roads like State Road 50, 436, 1792, and 441, and so on, as well as on I-4. Then the turnpike projects are, are of course, toll road projects that are uh, operated by uh, Florida's Turnpike Enterprise. Then the third category, what we call TISMO projects, these are transportation system management and operation projects. And these are relatively low cost projects that help improve safety and traffic flow. And so they include projects like minor intersection improvements, as well as uh, uh, computerized traffic signals and other uh, technology type of projects that you'll be hearing more about uh, later on in the presentation. Then the bicycle and pedestrian projects include bike trails such as West Orange Trail and Cross Seminole Trail and Shingle Creek and so on, as well as uh, bike lanes and sidewalks along existing roadways. Then the transit projects are improvements to uh, Lynx's fixed route bus uh, service as well as the other service that are operated by Lynx. And then the commuter rail projects in our region, of course, would apply to SunRail projects. And then the, uh, the aviation projects are those projects on the four airports in our region that receive federal and state funds. And these categories represent all the different transportation uh, modes that interact together as uh, part of this region's overall transportation system. Uh, next slide, please. Now, the process of developing this new TIP actually started last year when we put together our fiscal year 2026 to 2040 prioritized project list. And the prioritized project list is another document that we update uh, each year. And uh, we're now in the process of finalizing our new uh, list uh, for this year, but this is the one from last year. And we like to call this a bridge document because it kind of fills in the gap between the TIP, which covers the next five years, and what we used to call our uh, long range transportation plan and now called the Metropolitan Transportation Plan, uh, which uh, has a target year at least 20 to 25 years out in the future. And uh, this list included projects that were either completely unfunded or had unfunded phases in the five year work program and TIP as of last year. And it included separate lists of highway, TISBO, bike bed, and transit projects. And the projects under each of these lists were ranked uh, by priority as candidates for funding in the new TIP. And then this was used by the Florida Department of Transportation to develop their fiscal year 2022 to 2026 tentative five year work program. And then we use the work program to put together uh, our new TIP. Uh, next slide, please. Now, these are the uh, categories of the highway projects that were in last year's prioritized project list. Uh, they include the national highway system projects, which are major capacity improvements to I-4. So these mainly include the, the uh, beyond the ultimate improvements. And we're not gonna be going through the I-4 projects individually today, but I'm sure you all are familiar with the I-4 ultimate project that's been under construction for the last several years, which will include six general use lanes, four managed toll lanes, and reconstructing the uh, interchanges in the I-4 corridor. And the beyond the ultimate improvements will extend that throughout our three county region. And then there's also a truck parking facilities project under that uh, list as well. Then we have a list of projects that are on the state roadway system. And this is a mixture of different types of projects. Uh, some of these involve road in widening roads from two lanes to four lanes or four lanes to six lanes. But most of these are non-capacity, what we call context sensitive or complete streets projects. And you'll be hearing more about complete streets projects uh, later on in the presentation. But these are designed to help improve safety and access and traffic flow uh, on existing corridors without adding capacity. So they can include a combination of different types of projects like minor intersection improvements and putting in uh, sidewalks and bike lanes and bus pull-offs and so on, depending on how much space is available within the roadway corridor. And then there's a, a similar list of different types of projects on roadways that are mainly off the state road system. And for my part of the uh, presentation, I'm gonna be focusing on uh, the major uh, capacity uh, road projects in the TIP. Uh, next slide, please. I wanted to start off by looking at the four basic phases of a major capacity highway project. So again, this could include either construction of a new roadway, adding lanes to an existing roadway, or putting in a grade separated flyover interchange. And the first phase on there is the PD&E study, which is the Project Development and Environment Study. And this involves looking at the uh, various socioeconomic and environmental impacts of a major road project, 
uh, coming up with several uh, different alternatives for that project, and then eventually narrowing, narrowing those down to a single preferred alternative. After that comes the final design to determine exactly what goes where. Uh, then after that comes acquiring the right of way. And then of course the final phase is the actual construction of the project. And as you can see on the chart there, uh, each of these phases takes an average of up to two years or so to complete, sometimes longer than that, uh, depending on the project. So uh, this is a pretty lengthy process from start to finish. And I'm gonna be going over just a few of the uh, uh, major uh, capacity road projects that have phases funded in the new TIP. But before I do that, uh, we have a polling question that we would like everyone to participate in. And for that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mary Ann Horn. Thanks, Keith. Before we start to tell you about some of the particular projects coming down the pike, um, we'd like to find out a, a bit about you. Um, we're going to ask about your transportation personality type. Um, you'll see this question and some multiple choice answers displayed on your screen. Um, so to answer, you make your selection on the screen and click. And the question that we have for you is, which of these best describes your transportation personality? Are you a debater who sees possibilities for improving the system, but also barriers to many of those things and want to know how each idea will work? Are you an advocate? with a vision for a perfect transportation system that will be efficient and equitable so that everyone gets what they need. Maybe you feel that if we work together, Central Florida could really lead in transportation. If you are a logistician, perhaps you have your place in the transportation system all figured out and that works for you and you think there's no perfect system, but that people can learn to use what we have better. Or maybe, maybe you're an adventurer you think the best way to the future is uh, bold new solutions that nobody may have heard of before. Um, you're ready to go where no one has gone on your transportation journey. So I'll give you a few more seconds here to answer this question, which uh, perhaps is not entirely serious, but does have many grains of truth in it, I think. There's no right answer, of course. Um, all the ways of looking, all these ways of looking at our transportation system and some others are equally valid. We just, we just want to give you a couple of seconds to think about where you might fall. Okay, looks like, looks like uh, most of us, at least three quarters of our participants have weighed in here. I'll give it just a couple more seconds. And perhaps that's it. Let's look at the results. Most of us gathered today are advocates. You believe that there is a perfect system and you think we should go for it. <laughs> so that's great to know. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. And as the poll showed though, we do have people with all kinds of interests and orientations. Uh, several of you checked all of these different personality types. And we, we think that all of you, no matter what your personality type uh, for transportation, that you, you will learn something today. And um, we are certainly going to, to offer up the information to help you do that. Um, and, then, and then later, of course, hear from you. Um, First off, um, Keith is going to um, continue for us and talk, as he said, about some of the major highway projects. So, Keith, back to you. Hey, thank you. Um, I just wanted to briefly review um, four examples of major capacity uh, roadway projects that are uh, currently funded in the new TIP. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Uh, the first project I wanted to uh, look at is the sixth landing of State Road 50 from Avalon Park Boulevard to State Road 520, which is in East Orange County. Uh, this project is now funded for construction in fiscal year 2025, so that will be getting underway in just a few years. Uh, next slide. Then we have a project in Osceola County, <clears throat> which is the sixth landing of John Yard Parkway from uh, Pleasant Hill Road to Portage Street in Kissimmee. And this also includes a grade separated flyover at the John Young Parkway Pleasant Hill Road intersection. 
And the six laning and uh, flyover project are both still funded through right away. And the construction for that project is not yet funded. Uh, but there is an interim uh, intersection improvement uh, at that intersection called a quad road, which will help divert traffic away from that intersection uh, prior to the uh, uh, flyover being built. And that's now funded for construction in 2025. Uh, next slide. Then we have a six leaning project on uh, State Road 535 uh, from US 192 in Osceola County up to World Drive uh, near Disney World in Orange County. Uh, this project has a new design phase funded in fiscal year 2025, uh, but the right of way and construction phases uh, are not yet funded for that project. Uh, next slide. And then finally, we have a project in Seminole County, which is a four laning project on State Road 426, uh, County Road 419 from Pine Avenue to Avenue B in Obito. Uh, this project is actually ha has uh, construction uh, funded in the current fiscal year, fiscal year 2021. Uh, so it should be getting underway in the near future. Uh, but there is additional funding uh, program uh, in the new TIP also for this project in fiscal year 2022. And then I wanted to mention that this area, of course, has a lot of toll road facilities and projects that are uh, on that system that are either uh, under construction or funded uh, over the next five years. And we're not going to be going over toll road projects today, just in the interest of time. Uh, but we have staff available from Florida's Turnpike Enterprise and Central Florida Expressway Authority in case anyone has any questions or concerns about any of those projects. Um, so uh, at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Taylor Laurent, and she's going to talk about complete streets projects. And I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to uh, ask a question at any time during the meeting. And we will try to answer as many questions as we can after the individual uh, presentations are finished. So with that, I will turn it over to Taylor. Thank you, Keith. Hello, everyone. My name is Taylor Laurent, a transportation engineer and project manager with Metroplan Orlando. Complete streets are comprehensive, connected, and context-sensitive transportation facilities with infrastructure that is designed to allow safe and convenient travel along and across streets for all users, regardless of age or ability. This includes pedestrians, bicyclists, motorists, public transportation, and movers of commercial goods. As Keith mentioned, I will highlight some of our Complete Streets projects. Next slide, please. Thank you. The 10th Street Complete Streets study is to evaluate 10th Street from US 192 to South Narcusi Road for modifications to sidewalks and crosswalks, bicycle facilities, landscaping, drainage, and lighting. This is an ongoing planning study in Osceola County that will be completed in June of next year. Next slide. The Rock Springs Road Complete Street Study is to evaluate safety and access improvements of Rock Springs Road from Welch Road to Lester Road, evaluate realigning Sandpiper Street and the addition of sidewalks, as well as analyze the intersections of Rock Springs Road at Welch Road and Sandpiper Street. In the same area, we also have the West Orange Trail Extension Study, which is evaluating a connection of the existing West Orange Trail to Kelly Park Road and tying into the proposed Wakiva Trail, as well as reviewing connections to the Wakiva Springs State Park and other recreation areas within Apopka. Both of these planning studies are ongoing in Orange County and should be completed in December of next year. Next slide. Also in Orange County, we have a sidewalk, trail, and safety improvements that will be installed along Corinne Drive, Virginia Drive, and Forest Avenue. The design phase is fully funded for fiscal year 2023-24 and construction should begin in fiscal year 2026, pending agreements with our local partners. Next slide. In Seminole County, we have the addition of roundabouts and trail and other safety improvements to State Road 434 from west of Jetta Point to south of Artesia Street. The project design is complete and will move forward into right of way in fiscal year 2025 with construction programmed in later years. Next slide. In Osceola County, we have roundabouts, sidewalks, and safety improvements planned for Marigold Avenue from San Lorenzo Road to Peabody Road. The design of these improvements is funded for this next fiscal year, 2021-22. 
and construction is funded in fiscal year 2025. Next slide. And next we have Jasmine Blaze, who will tell you about bicycle and pedestrian projects in the region and keep those questions coming in the Q&A box. We have our panel waiting to answer them. Hi everyone, um, I'm a transportation planner uh, with Metro Plan Orlando and this section will cover some upcoming bike and pedestrian projects in the region. Uh, the following projects are funded for construction in uh, years 2024 and 2025. Next slide. <clears throat> Uh, so to start off, uh, we're just going to highlight a few in each county. Uh, Orange County is the Shingle Creek Kirkman Trail. Um, the new trail addition will connect the broader trail running all the way to Kissimmee Lakefront, which is uh, the new blue segment. Um, the new section will be located between Old Winter Garden Road and to Raleigh Street near uh, the Valencia College campus. Next slide. Uh, in Osceola County, uh, we have Bog Boggy Creek Elementary and Parkway Middle School uh, sidewalk additions. Um, so various sidewalks and pedestrian improvements will be added within a one mile radius of both schools uh, to help with safety. Next slide. Same here with Hickory Tree Elementary School sidewalks in Osceola County. Um, also various sidewalks and pedestrian improvements will be added um, to improve safety as well. Next slide. Um, so here in Seminole County, uh, the Central Castleberry Connectivity uh, Improvement um, Project will include improvements for people walking and biking on Hibiscus Road, Marigold Road, Palm Drive, and South Winter Park Drive. Uh, it will also include accessibility, uh, sidewalks, shared use paths, and uh, crosswalks improvements. <clears throat> The project will provide safer and more comfortable connectivity between the neighborhoods, the transit service on State Road 436 uh, and Castleberry Greenway Trail. The project will also complement other street improvements proposed for Winter Park Drive. Now I'm going to turn it over to Eric Hill to talk about our transportation system maintenance and operation projects. Keep, uh, keep on putting your questions in the Q&A box and we will answer those shortly. Good morning. I'm Eric Hill. I'm the Director of Transportation Systems Management and Operations at Metro Plan Orlando. Uh, TISMO is how we refer to it. And TISMO is the use of information, communication, and technology to improve safety, reliability, sustainability, and economic development in our community and on our roads. This morning, I'm going to share with you some of the exciting TISMO projects we have in the TIP. The focus areas will be technology, intersection improvements, and safety. Next slide. First project is Attain Central Florida. Florida DOT District 5, Metro Plan Orlando, and University of Central Florida partnered on a grant application to the Federal Highway Administration to bring more technology to Central Florida, specifically Orange County, in and around the University of Central Florida. The use of this technology will also allow us to scale it up throughout the region so that the lessons we learn, we can spread and use in other areas of our planning area. A team will include implementing three different types of technology. Ped Safe will look at how we can use technology to mitigate collisions between vehicles, bicyclists, as well as pedestrians. Greenway technology will allow us to improve mobility on our roadways, reduce congestion, as well as improve travel times. Smart community is, a, is an application that will allow individuals to connect to people and places and, and to, to use different ways of travel. And then lastly, Sunstore. This is where we can collect a lot of data that can be used in our research efforts. Next slide. Technology application partnerships with local agencies is an opportunity for us to use computer learning as well as computer vision systems to conduct two Carter studies in our planning area. One will be on US 192 West in Osceola County and the second one will be on US 1792 East, both in Osceola County. Next slide. US 192. This card is usually is normally used by tourists 
uh, having or getting accessibility to uh, Champion Gates area, to uh, attraction parks, uh, as well as other uh, retail locations in this corridor. Locations where we'll be collecting this data uh, will include Black Lake Road, Formosa Gardens Boulevard, Sherwood Road, and North Old Lake Wilson Road. Next slide. A similar technology will be used on US 1792 East. Again, the applications will be on roadways Oak Street, Emmett Road, Holman Boulevard, excuse me, Holman Boulevard and Pleasant Hill Road. In both instances, uh, this technology in both corridors are connected with Osceola County's Traffic Management Center and the, the network itself in Osceola County. And both are funded in fiscal year 21-22. Now I'm going to turn it over to Laura Balk to cover some other exciting TISMO projects, including our signal retiming program. And remember to keep the questions coming. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. My name is Laura Bauck. I'm a senior transportation engineer with MetroPlan Orlando, and I'm going to speak about a couple of additional projects that fall under that TISMO umbrella, starting with our traffic signal retiming program. So every year since 2007, MetroPlan Orlando has provided funding for the retiming and coordination of traffic signals throughout the three county region as a way of mitigating congestion, making our roadways more efficient, and also to improve air quality and safety. So each year we work with our agency partners to identify which signals in the region need to be retimed. And then we implement those new timing plans for each of the selected corridors or at individual signals. We've seen significant benefits from this program over the years. And this slide provides a snapshot of the benefits realized from the retimings we implemented last year. So as shown here on the slide, signals were retimed at 30 corridor segments. And of those 28 of the 30 or 93%, had shorter end-to-end -end travel times after they were retimed. We also retimed signals at 17 standalone intersections. Of those, 14 were at or near schools, and so the focus was on adjusting signal timings to improve operations and safety during drop-off and pickup times. Following the retimings, 57% or eight of the 14 school intersections had less intersection delay. You can also see in the box near the center of the slide the overall benefits for the 2020 program in terms of reduced delay, fuel savings, and reduced vehicle emissions. Next slide, please. We just wrapped up our signal retimings for this fiscal year, where signals were retimed on 21 corridor segments and at over 15 intersections. All of the retimings for the fiscal year 21 program are now complete as of a few weeks ago, and we're proceeding with the evaluation of impacts from that work. We anticipate that the analysis will com be completed for that in the coming fall. We're also currently moving forward with developing of retimings for next fiscal year. We've received requests for retiming projects on 28 corridors to date, and that work will begin in earnest with initial data collection occurring in the late summer and early fall. Next slide, please. Uh, and then the final funded project that I will touch on is one that will upgrade traffic signal cabinets at 156 signalized intersections throughout Orange County. This work is funded for design in the coming fiscal year and for construction in fiscal year 2025. Traffic signal cabinets house the computers and sensors that control traffic signal timing. And so upgrading these cabinets is important for a number of reasons. Those include improve, or providing more computing power, adding some flexibility to provide for additional signal phases, and perhaps most importantly, it allows the region to modernize that architecture to better support operations in a connected and automated vehicle environment. So this project will really help to support Orange County and the region as we prepare for the future and those emerging vehicle technologies become more widespread. And now Sarah Larson is gonna talk about the transit projects in the TIP. And as a reminder, you have a few more minutes to add your questions to the Q&A list. Thanks, Laura. Uh, hello, my name is Sarah Larson. I'm a transportation planner with MetroPlan, uh, and I will be reviewing the transit projects for the Lynx bus service and the SunRail commuter rail. Um, next slide. Um, the new Lynx transfer center in Pine Hills is currently in permitting and is expected to be completed by the end of the summer. Uh, construction is expected to begin in late fall or early winter. Next slide. 
Lynx has begun the transition of the limo service to no emission battery electric buses. The first eight buses entered service in January 2021, um, and an additional six buses are scheduled to enter service in spring 2022, which will fully transition the fleet. Uh, this project is a partnership between Lynx, the City of Orlando, and the Orlando Utilities Commission. Next slide. Um, under uh, under uh, procurement is uh, professional services to identify and assess potential sites for Lynx's new operations and maintenance facility in Osceola County. Uh, this is a four-month project, and it's expected to be completed in fall of 2021. Next slide. Um, for the next few fiscal years, Lynx will be installing approximately 25 to 30 shelters per year and rehabbing 100 to 150 shelters per year. Um, the Rosemont Superstop uh, began reconstruction in May 2021 and is expected to be completed in four months. Uh, the Florida Mall Superstop is currently under bid and will start construction in fall 2021. Next slide. The construction of SunRail's Phase 2 North expansion includes um, one new SunRail station in DeLand. Um, it's approximately 12 miles of expanded commuter rail service between the DeBerry SunRail station and the DeLand Amtrak station in Volusia County. Um, this improvement will provide a safe and efficient transportation alternative for motorists and enhance safety features along the corridor and improve grade crossings for train, pedestrian, and vehicular traffic. Uh, the phase two North expansion is currently expected to be open by the summer of 2024. Next slide. And now Mike Wilson will talk about safety projects. Good afternoon, I'm Mike Wilson, a senior transportation planner here at uh, Metro Plan Orlando to talk to you about safety. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we've had two main uh, projects going on in the past uh, couple of years to improve safety in the area. One is our pedestrian and bicyclist safety action plan. We're in the second phase of that plan now. In the first phase, we identified a number of corridors that uh, could benefit from a variety of, of uh, countermeasures. We're gonna be bringing forward six of those corridors for project applications. So these currently aren't in the TIP, but we'll be moving into the TIP in, in, in the next couple of years. We're also looking at behavioral strategies. How can we use education and enforcement to get the kind of behaviors that we want in order to improve transportation safety, uh, particularly for pedestrians and cyclists. Next slide, please. Uh, these are the corridors that we identified in the first phase and that we're currently developing as projects. You can see Lake Mary Boulevard and Red Bug Lake Road in Seminole County, uh, Washington Street, Michigan Street and Pershing Avenue in Orange County. And we have Michigan Avenue in St. Cloud in Osceola County. As I said, these are not currently projects but we'll be moving into the TIP in future years. Next slide. We're also looking at corridors more broadly um, while you know, pedestrian and bicycle crashes do account for about a quarter of our traffic fatalities, obviously there's fatalities involved for, for all modes. And so we identified 13 high crash corridors along the state road system. And these represented 38 miles of our state road system, but accounted for 23% of all the fatal and serious injury crashes. And what we're doing through these studies is we're looking at the crash problems and then identifying solutions for those problems, again, for all modes. And we're currently completing the first four corridors of those 13. And again, like with the pedestrian and bicycle corridors, these aren't currently TIP projects, but we, these will develop into those in the future years. Now I'm gonna hand it back over to Keith Kasky, who will wrap things up for us and uh, talk about the next steps for the TIP. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, <laughs> these, these are the uh, the, the corridors themselves in our safety studies in the uh, Silver Star Road, uh, South Orange Blossom Trail, uh, and then two sections on East Colonial uh, from near Cimarron all the way out to Alafaya. Thank you. And back to Keith. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, just wanted to briefly cover the next steps in the development of our new TIP. 
uh, if we could go to the next slide, thank you. And uh, after the public meeting today, this will be going to our uh, four advisory committees and then to the Metroplan Orlando Board uh, for their review and approval. And this slide shows the schedule for that. Uh, the first meeting will be the Community Advisory Committee, which will be this coming Wednesday. And this group is made up of private citizens that have an interest in transportation issues. And uh, some of the members of this committee represent uh, the uh, cities and counties in, their, in our region. And then others represent specific interest groups like the uh, transportation disadvantaged and business community and so on. And then uh, two of our other committees are both meeting on Friday. Uh, these include the TISMO, the Transportation System Management and Operations Advisory Committee, which is made up of local traffic engineers that are involved in the planning and implementation of TISMO type projects. And then the Technical Advisory Committee is made up of uh, local uh, engineers and planners from our jurisdictions and agencies. Then the Municipal Advisory Committee will be meeting on July 1st. Uh, this group is mainly made up of the mayors of the smaller municipalities in our region that are not directly uh, represented on our board. And then finally, uh, the Metroplan Orlando Board will be meeting on July 7th, and they will review and hopefully approve uh, the TIP. And once the TIP has been adopted uh, by our board, it has to be submitted to the Florida Department of Transportation uh, by mid-July. And the TIP is never really uh, finalized. It's continually amended as additional funding becomes available. Uh, new projects or project phases get funded in the new TIP. Or, uh, and then uh, projects can move up and so on. And the process of uh, amending the TIP continues throughout the year as needed. So uh, with that, uh, I'm gonna, uh, we have another uh, polling question. And for that, I'll turn it back over to Marianne. Thank you, Keith. And, and thank you to all our presenters. Our goal here was to give you um, a quick recap of some of the projects that, that we see as being, you know, of high interest in our TIP. There are many, many more projects. Before we move on to your questions, we're gonna ask you one more question and you see it there on your screen. The question is, where should Central Florida increase its spending the most to improve our transportation system? You've heard about all the different categories and areas, uh, whether it's regional, state and local roads, our complete streets, projects that uh, serve all users um, and transit and our bicycle and pedestrian projects, uh, which you heard about. Also our, our TISMO, Transportation System Maintenance and Operations Solutions, which includes our signal retiming as well as um, several other exciting futuristic things. Um, transit, our bus and rail connections um, and or safety. Uh, safety uh, projects of all types to keep everyone using the transportation system safe. So we're going to take a few more seconds. Um, you are answering the question and I wanna see what you think. Okay, maybe just one or two more seconds. I think most everybody who's going to weigh in on this question has done that now. Um, so yeah, let's see the answers. What do you think? By a long shot, the answer uh, I can tell you is, is what we often hear out in the community is that Central Florida needs to spend more on transit. Um, bus and rail connections. We hear a lot about that, and um, and we appreciate your your interest in that. Um, so we uh, before we move on to the questions, one more thing I do want to tell you is that we appreciate your feedback. It helps to know um, what you're thinking. And I want to remind you that the entire draft TIP, again, this was just a recap of high points. The entire TIP is on our website at metroplanorlando.org. Uh, we also have an interactive tool um, that can help you search out projects that are important to you. Um, 
And uh, some of the questions that we had both at registration and coming into the Q&A box are, are very specific. And we may not get to all of those today, but there is a tool that you can use um, on our website to find that. And we even have a video on our YouTube channel that explains how to use, uh, how to use that tool and, and find um, now or anytime projects that are in the five-year plan that are in your neighborhood or on your route to work or something that you have a particular interest in. Um, we're going to put those links in the chat for you now so that you can find our, um, our TIP resources on our website, our interactive TIP tool, and the video that helps you get the most out of that tool by showing you how to look up the projects that are important to you. And uh, remember also that you can continue to submit comments um, based on what you have seen today and also what you may see in your own research. We will be taking um, email comments through Wednesday of this week, June 23rd. Um, and you'll send those to um, our comment at metroplanorlando.org email box. So now it's time for your questions. And we started this off actually with um, questions from you as you registered. If you remember, we had uh, we we asked you to fill in um, a block on your registration, um, asking if you had questions and comments, and several of you um, responded at that time. Um, we had questions there about um, transit. Um, many people wanting to know more about SunRail and uh, when it will um, begin to extend its operations into weekends, or uh, we also had questions about um, where it will go next. Uh, and we have questions in the box right now that, that mirror a lot of those. Will Sun, when will SunRail go to the airport? Um, and um, when, will it, when will it run on weekends? Um, those are questions that we get a lot when we were out in the community. Um, we, had, uh, we had some questions about um, transportation equity. And, and as I mentioned, we had some specific um, questions. So um, we might, uh, perhaps we should uh, kick off with um, what I thought was a, was a good question for us, which is um, the questioner, wrote on the registration, um, can you provide some specific examples on how the TIP will um, promote equity in regional mobility for people who do not have cars? Um, now, as, as you heard in our, pro uh, in our project overviews, we, do, um, we have increased our emphasis on complete streets projects that offer transit access. Um, and um, we also have uh, with us um, representatives from Lynx, um, Mr. Miles O'Keefe. Um, do you wish to, to weigh in for us on, uh, on transit from the bus angle? Sure, not a problem. So equity is obviously a key piece of a lot of what we explore and what we plan for within, within transit for Central Florida. So that, that's always been in important for us to, to include in how we go about programming different projects. Um, specifically within this, this tip, um, we, we can highlight, or I think we must highlight the efforts to uh, develop a new Southern operations base. Um, the prioritized project list listed as a third operating base, but this is really a, a means for us to to, to reach the growing and existing needs of, of transit within Central Florida. So our current operations and maintenance facility is, is at capacity. So without the ability to add any additional vehicles, we really can't serve any more markets or provide greater frequency to our existing uh, route areas. So to, to it, it's not a cool thing to say, I suppose, you know, build a facility to then grow, but it is, it is a key point of progress for us in order to provide more services to those without uh, personal automobiles available to them at home. 
thanks, Miles. There was another um, technical question about um, bus transit. Um, one of our questioners <laughs> wants to know, and we hear this in the community, wants to know why they see so many empty buses. Yeah, so a lot of that, a lot of that, I mean, one one question, lots of answers, and a lot of reasons to those answers. Um, no, nothing simple, but uh, part of it gets to how our system is designed currently, in that it is largely a hub and spoke model. Many of the routes come downtown, they feed in, and then individuals transfer. So you'll see a lot of activity at key transfer locations, and then certain routes will pick up some of that higher ridership from that. So what you typically see is you, you might see a bus that is not at full capacity, and that's because it tends to be feeding into a larger route somewhere else in the system, and that ends up holding a higher uh, higher occupancy uh, of the seats. In addition, um, Central Florida has uh, travel patterns that are a little different to what you might see in other regions. The peak AM and PM travel isn't as sharp uh, relative to the middle, middle of the day. So you see a lot of individuals also traveling throughout the middle of the day. So as a result, um, it's kind of a consistent occupancy on the buses uh, for our ridership. Um, another, another piece of it is uh, from our, our operating expense and maintenance expense standpoint, it's, it's easier to maintain a similar size vehicle or the similar vehicle, in our case, a 40 foot bus, um, in terms of what the skill set and the tools and the equipment needs are to maintain those vehicles. The more vehicles we have of different shapes and sizes, the harder it is to keep everything in stock and have a short turnaround time on any kind of maintenance. So it's easier uh, from us to program plan and maintain these same large buses uh, instead of having specified buses for certain routes as you go throughout the region. So there's a lot it kind of feeds into to why you might see a larger bus uh, with, with a not 100% occupancy. Great, thank you very much. Um, for, the, for the rail piece of it, when we're talking about SunRail, um, there is, there's a lot going on with SunRail, which is transitioning um, from being run by the the Florida Department of Tran Transportation into local control that has not yet happened. Um, I, I'm going to put Ms. Tanya Laurie <laughs> on the spot about a subject. It's not really on the spot because it's a subject that she knows well. I, um, I wonder, Tanya, if you could, could tell us a little bit more about the transition process and about what the possibilities are for for the expansion of service, both the hours of service and, and also in the routes served, um, the air, airport piece is of particular interest. Sure, um, so right now FDOT is operating the system. Um, the five local funding partners, which include Osceola, Orange, Seminole, and Volusia counties, as well as the city of Orlando, have um, contracted with a consultant um, to put together a transition plan and implementation schedule. Um, and so that consultant is under contract now and they are scheduled to be finished in a little over a year from now. Um, so they're analyzing all parts of the system, including um, the staffing that's there today, um, all of the improvements on the, uh, on the railroad to see if they're in a good state of good repair. They're analyzing all the contracts. Um, they're doing a financial assessment. So they're getting ready to start putting together this implementation plan. Now, the exact date of transition is not um, known at this time. Uh, due to the fact that DOT, as was mentioned earlier, is expanding the system up to the land. And so we suspect um, once DOT has that expansion in place and has operated it for a period of time, then the system will be transitioned. And we're probably looking at more towards the end of 2024, 20, early 2025. Um, and our transition consultant, for those of you that want to have up-to-date information, um, you can tune in to either the SunRail Customer Advisory 
uh, committee or the technical advisory committee because our transition consultant is always on the agenda, given an up-to-date status report on, on those transition activities. Um, in terms of expansion of the system to OIA, uh, the local funding partners are also um, analyzing that now in concert with Brightline. So Brightline, uh, many of you know, is under construction to go from OIA, the airport, down to Miami. Um, they're also in talks with the FDOT and the partners about expanding the Brightline service over to Tampa. Um, and so our local funding partners are analyzing that um, expansion over to the airport and what the service needs to be both on the north-south main line as well as to the airport as well as um, during weekends. So we're looking at all of that right now. There is no time frame as of yet of when it would be extended, but I do know that there is interest in doing so. Um, did I capture all of those questions or answers to those questions? I, th I think that you did, and uh, and we'll we'll continue to hear from folks. So I appreciate your okay. stepping into that, and and also illustrating. Tawny has been very involved with uh, with Sunrail, and now you know it serves a a pivotal role as as we're transitioning um, control. And she also brought up something else that has uh, has made its way uh, into our questions, um, which is Brightline. And um, for this question, I, I am going to turn to Mr. Will Hawthorne, who's here um, representing uh, Central Florida Expressway Authority. Um, Will, are you are you on? Hey, Marianne. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> Hi. Thank Oops. you. Yes. Um, and so a, a, a questioner before we've had a couple of references, I think, here in the box and also um, at registration. A questioner wanted to know um, the status of talks on on Brightline um, and and where it where it uh, it might be going, and wanting to know will there be a stop at or near the drive I drive area? Um, so maybe you could fill us in a little bit about what's going on with uh, with Brightline. Sure. The uh, the extent of my knowledge is what's been discussed at our board meetings, um, and that's. You know, they're still trying to get some information from, from Brightline to see um, if there's going to be an alternate route. So they've kind of been working towards the 417 route for the airport to Tampa, um, Orlando to Tampa um, line. So I, I don't have a lot to offer on that, to be honest with you. I know we will have a board meeting in July to try and uh, run that to ground. So if the public wants to tune into that on Orange TV. They're welcome to do so. It'll be Ju July 20th. Let me look at the calendar. I believe it's July 20th at 8.30. But it'll be posted on our website when that meeting uh, is official, but I think that's where it's headed. As for the bright line from West Palm to the airport, uh, we meet with them bi-weekly. They're, they're I think targeting the start line track as early as September. So they're they're moving along pretty quickly. Does that answer all the questions? I'm yes, thank thank you, Will. Uh, that that was a good insight and uh, and I hope that um, that people who are interested in Brightline took note of that that upcoming meeting um, because they are easy to watch online. And also as both uh, Tawny and Will um, alluded to, um, but I'll underscore your bright line is a private company. And so their entrance into our region, of course, is a little bit different from some of the other projects that we talk at, about. And yet, you know, uh, they will be um, a part of our transportation system here when, when they arrive. And so we know, we know that people are interested in that. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I think that the, uh, the next area where we saw um, the most interest was in our uh, pedestrian and, and cyclist initiatives. Um, we had uh, we had some questions about um, we, we had some people who who voiced some interest in particular on having more uh, more bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure 
and we've had some questions about some specific um, areas, including uh, downtown on Pine Street. Um, we had a question about the bike lane there. And um, that is actually a city of Orlando project, uh, not in our TIP. We do have uh, Mr. Gus Castro with us today from the city of Orlando. Um, Gus, um, are you on? Would you be able to answer what is going on with the bike lane project on Pine Street? Thanks, Marianne. Uh, I'm not very familiar with that um, with that section. The issue uh, over there is like on Pine Street, there are competing interests between um, bicycle lanes and on street parking. So uh, that's going to be analyzed, you know, uh, further on, and uh, we will try to coordinate with the overall regional um, bicycle plan to to make sure that everything is connected because it makes sense when you have a connected system. It doesn't make sense if you have just a, a few blocks uh, by itself. Uh, so the importance here is connectivity overall. Does that answer a question? Um, I hope so, yes. <laughs> I think that was a pretty good answer. Um, and, um, oh, I'm told we had a, a hand up from Orange County. Um, Mr. Nastasi, did you wish to say something? I'm sorry, did I? That's okay. Back, uh, thank you, Mary. I'm back on the, the bright line conversation. Sure. Uh, there's going to be a workshop tomorrow morning at the Board of County Commissioners, and folks can tune in uh, on Orange TV. Uh, so um, there'll be additional information, just an update on bright line <laughs> tomorrow at the board meeting in the morning. Okay. Well, thank you. That's great information. And um, and if you have never tried it. The, the Orange TV meetings, that's, that's a very uh, easy and good way to watch the, um, to watch these um, governmental meetings. And, and I do it often and you can, you can see in real time what's happening. So thank, thank you for that, Renzo. Um, continuing with, uh, with our interest in bike and pedestrian facilities, we had a question about a sidewalk um, project in the Avalon Park Boulevard Colonial area. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, um, if Ms. Anna Taylor from the Florida Department of Transportation would be able to speak about that. Give us an, an update on the status of, of whether there will be sidewalks out there in that extension area. Anna, are you on? Perhaps she stepped away, we'll come back. We have many more questions, not a problem. Um, we have a question about the um, Shingle Creek alignment. Um, and um, the questioner wants to know um, whether this will include sidewalk or wide sidewalk that uh, you know serves for both cyclists and pedestrians or uh, whether that will be a, a separate bike lane. And um, let's see, Jas Jasmine um, Blaze, are you able to answer that? Or, or Mike Wilson to chime in on that? Marianne, this, this is yes, right. Yes, Rinto. So yes. I, I presume they're talking about the Shingle Creek Trail south of Destination Parkway down to the Osceola County line. So obviously the section from Destination Parkway down to Central Florida Parkway that runs along Shingle Creek and then it veers to the east along uh, Central Florida Parkway and then south along John Young Parkway. So uh, John Young Parkway already have has sidewalks uh, uh, already in place and the Shingle Creek Trail will apparent will be within the uh, right of way of uh, John Young Parkway. So the, the si sidewalks are already existing, but obviously on the trail, both cyclists and pedestrians can utilize that new trail once it's constructed. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, 
did uh, did we have anything to add from our staff or? Yeah, I was just going to add if we were also talking about the Shingle Creek section that was part of the presentation in the tip between Raleigh and Old Winter Garden, that is actually going to be off of Kirkman Road uh, following the canal. Um, so it'll be a shared use path off of the road, not just a wide sidewalk. Okay. Thank you, Nick. Um, and another area where we had a lot of questions um, was also dealing with technology. And uh, we, we had um, one person ask about uh, as people transition to more electric vehicles, uh, what are our plans for, um, for EV um, charging? And that's a question that we get a lot out in the community. I think um, Eric Hill is uh, prepared to talk about this and maybe Gus Castro wants to add something uh, particular about the city's efforts after that. Sure, uh, good. that's a great question. And, and as we continue to evolve into the 21st century, uh, the emergence of technology is gonna certainly take a greater role in our mobility. Uh, and Metro Plan Orlando is preparing for that. And so we are working with the local jurisdictions on, on how we can move forward with developing an infrastructure that's going to support electric vehicles. And our work will certainly build on the work that the Florida DOT has already done in this area. Uh, but most of it will be just coordinating with the local jurisdictions and uh, understanding our role and how to uh, develop a, a infrastructure, uh, community, if you will, that will support uh, the emergence of electric vehicles. And I'll uh, defer to uh, Mr. Castro on, on some of the work that the city of Orlando is doing in this area. Yeah, thanks, Eric. Yeah, uh, it's exciting that we have a, a, the Office of Sustainability and, and also um, Smart Cities um, initiatives in the city. And one of the first things that uh, we're doing in conjunction with the Orlando Utility Commission, so you see, is to implement an EV charging hub in uh, downtown, in the heart of downtown Orlando, uh, right there on Robinson Street, uh, just east of Garland, where the existing OUC uh, um, substation is so we're very excited about this project and it's going to be a great asset especially for downtown orlando um uh, the question actually in general was uh, in other you know charging uh, plans for other ev charging uh places and and in the, in the city we have you know policies for um we're trying to implement um, you know uh, incorporate um EV charging as, as a strategy for supporting and, and getting away from fossil fuels uh, and, and, and different, you know, alternative for, for, um, for um, um, uh, propulsion. Uh, there's a big difference. I was talking to Eric about this, a big difference between propulsion and navigation. And propulsion is basically looking into different types of uh, um, alternatives like, you know, hydrogen, um, electric uh, uh, alternative to fossil fuel, and then navigation will be the automatic vehicle issues. Okay, thank you, um, Eric and Gus, um, for that update. Um, another uh, question we had uh, dealt with signal retiming. So I'm gonna turn to Ms. Um, Lara Balk on that one. And the questioner wanted to know, um, how signal retiming may affect cross street delays or delays for pedestrians and whether or not that's that's an issue in our retiming program. Laura, you're the expert on that. I, I am. Thank you, Marianne. It's a good question. So our retiming teams do go out and do field reviews um, before they implement the retimings to assess where and how the signal timing needs to be adjusted to provide adequate green time for all movements at an intersection, including at cross streets and to provide for pedestrian movements. And I think I saw a related question asking about uh, providing the all red with only the pedestrian signal working. And so right now, when requested by our maintaining agencies, the teams do also look at the potential for providing what we call the, the leading pedestrian uh, intervals uh, where the signals are all red and the pedestrians can proceed. And then I also wanted to mention that after the retimings are implemented, there's a 30 day monitoring period where the teams go out to make sure that the new signal timings are working appropriately and make sure everyone is getting the time that they need. Okay, 
Thank you for, for that explanation. And, um, and then we also have um, several questions that I would, would call location specific questions. And, and I'm gonna take up a couple of those because I suspect that other people are also interested. But bef before I do that, um, I, uh, I wanted to, to take up a question that, um, it was not really a question. <laughs> well, it was a question and a comment. And um, the, the questioner commenter uh, pointed out that we have spent a lot of this program talking about um, pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure, transit, complete streets. And yet the, the questioner feels that our region is still very, very entrenched in a you know, capacity type mindset, um, automobile dependent um, sort of region. And, and his, the question part of his question comment is quite blunt. He, he says simply, when are we gonna put our money where our mouth is? Um, and we hear this a lot. We, we hear this type of um, frustration uh, from people who, who want to see some of these other programs move ahead more quickly. I think I might um, call on our um, director of uh, transportation planning, Mr. Nick Lepp, to talk a little bit about how we are, are shifting our priorities in this direction because we are. So Nick, could you help? Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. Yes, absolutely. Um, so a lot of, uh, if you haven't been involved uh, prior to this, um, this public meeting for our TIP, uh, we just recently adopted and finished the completion of our 2045 Metropolitan Transportation Plan, as Keith mentioned. That is our long range vision. Um, this five year plan is part of that vision or actually was part of the last vision. So a lot of the projects that you see in our transportation improvement program all came out of that 2040 long range plan, which at that time was still very much a largely roadway widening uh, engineering plan for uh, wider roads. Since then, Metroplan has been starting to transition and focus more on multimodal and safety and bicycle pedestrian connectivity. And we are starting to put our money where our mouth is through this planning effort and the adoption of that 2045 plan, which is largely more multimodal and does focus uh, widely on complete streets and safety improvements uh, within the region over the next 20 years. And now we're going to start seeing those projects come to fruition within the transportation improvement program starting to feed into that now. There still are some projects in there that we know are needed for some widening, but we are starting to look at those uh, closer and starting to move into the complete streets and maintenance of our system uh, for safety more so than just widening roads. So um, I know it's it's tough to say that we're there, we're getting there, um, but we do have our plan in place and we are starting to implement those projects that you'll start seeing. Thank you, Nick. And, um, you know, again, like I said, this is, this is a, a common type of question that we get out in the community and it's very understandable. And I think that, um, you know, you saw our video and you heard um, Keith's presentation about the phases of projects and you see that transportation moves, moves slowly. Um, big projects like the ones we handle um, do have a long, long life. Um, but we are trying to, to look toward the future on that. Um, I wanted to take up a, a couple, um, well, before, you know, actually before I do that, there was another sort of a question that, that several people ask in different ways. And um, I'm not sure we, we actually address that um, or if we can entirely, but the, the question is, when are we going to get a um, 24 hour uh, bus and rail system? When are we going to expand our hours? When are we going to see um, transit going more? And, uh, and what, can we, what can we do just to improve that system um, most quickly? Um, if, if you don't mind, Nick, I'm gonna call on you again to address the overall and, and then maybe I'll, I'll hit uh, Miles and Tawny again for specifics on, on bus and rail. Sure, and I, I think uh, Miles um, touched on it earlier when he was talking about some of the projects that are coming out of Lynx and, and he mentioned that right now, uh, their current 
maintenance and uh, facility is over capacity. So it is, they are unable and we are unable to help support links in the expansion of transit until we have more room for some more buses. Um, and with that also will come some significant operation costs that we still don't uh, quite have budgeted yet. So those are two components uh, to having 24 hour bus service and more frequent bus service that we're still trying to overcome now in the short term, even with our, our current system, but to expand it and, and to get it to meet what we're trying to do for our, our, our longer term vision. Um, and then I'll turn it over to Miles if there's any more specifics you would like to add. Thanks, Nick. Uh, yeah, so we, we, we do have plans to, to obviously change our system to better reflect the needs today of, of Central Florida and, and what we project the future needs to be. Uh, it is, current as it's currently constructed, it is largely unchanged for over the last 25 plus years. We acknowledge that there are areas and instances where that's not, um, not the best use or the best design as it once may have been. Uh, so part of this is in the interim until larger, perhaps dedicated funding sources can be identified for, for transit, uh, we're, we're taking interim steps with each service change to see what can be modified. This is, everything from reallocating resources from a route that may have lower ridership to one that is showing the need for earlier or later night uh, trips. It could be adding frequency in the middle of the day when we are seeing crowding on some routes or some trips as well. Uh, it's it's uh, definitely our desire to provide more frequency throughout the entirety of our system, uh, as well as to provide greater coverage, be it day of week or time of day. Um, it is, it's a, it's a work in progress with all of our funding partners and uh, it's, it's not something that we intend on deviating from. It's just, as has been noted several times, it takes time to identify the resources to make those reality. I think it's Tani. Great, thanks Miles. So in terms of DOT, FDOT is still, you know, um, running the SunRail program until it's transitioned over, but I will say that they have increased the service. So when the system started, it was about 32 trains a day and it was half hour peak with um, one and a half to two hours off peak. So they had 20, 32 trains in a day. Um, they have increased the service to 40 trains per day once um, they expanded the system to Osceola County for phase two south back in 2018. Um, that put the service at half hour peak and about one hour off peak. So the trains currently run from about five to 11 um, on every weekday, which is Monday through Friday. Um, in terms of going 24 hours, um, SunRail will never be able to go for 24 hour service because there are agreements with CSX who used to be the owner of the railroad that the uh, freight trains have exclusive rights between midnight and 5 a.m. However, between those hours, SunRail could increase their service as demand warrants. Um, there are no um, plans right now to increase the service from what it is except for the expansion to DeLand. Um, however, as I noted before, as we're looking at expanding the service to OIA, um, there would be a need um, to increase um, the service to weekends because the OIA is a airport that um, is seven days a week. So that's um, being looked at and is part of that analysis of looking at the expansion. But for right now, there are no dates of when that would be expanded to the airport, um, but DOT is um, expanding the system to DeLand. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Nick and Miles and Tawny. Um, for that, uh, and, and we know that that is something very much on people's minds. Um, I am in fact a bus rider myself and I, uh, I am very much <laughs> always looking at, uh, at bus service and how it serves us. Um, we have now um, some of these specific questions and I'm gonna call on Mr. Um, Keith Kasky first um, to tell us a little bit about a, a project that I, I believe is in Winter Park. It's um, the 1792 and, and Fairbanks uh, corridor. We had, a, we had a question about that. Um, Keith, can you help with that? Okay, um, well, there's, there's actually 
two projects that uh, kind of affect that uh, intersection. There's a, a project from on to improve 1792 at sidewalks and improve access from Nottingham Road up to Monroe Street, which covers uh, pretty much the entire Winter Park City limits. And that project uh, was funded through design uh, sometime prior to fiscal year 2021. So it doesn't show up in the new TIP. Uh, at, th at this point, there are no additional phases funded for that project. Uh, and then at the intersection of uh, Fairbanks and 1792, uh, there was a there's an intersection uh, improvement there, uh, which uh, shows about three hundred and forty thousand uh, dollars program for construction in fiscal year 2021. So again, it doesn't show up in the new TIP either, since that you know, covers 22 to 26. Um, beyond that, I'm not really sure about the specifics of that project. But uh, again, it, it does show up as being funded for construction. Thanks, Keith. And, and while I have you <laughs> here, there's another uh, more general question that, uh, that I think you can answer for us as well. And it's about how projects get funded. The questioner wants to know um, how projects that are not federally funded, that don't inc include any federal funding, are coordinated with the TIP. Okay, well, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, the uh, we as an MPO are required to include any projects in the TIP that include federal or state funds. Now, the the uh, the federal funding requirement is is based on federal legislation, and then it varies by state, you know, state by state as to whether state funds are are required. You know, here in Florida, we are required to show state funded projects as well. So those are included in with the uh, uh, federally funded projects. Now, uh, I also mentioned that we include locally funded projects. Uh, those are not um, required to be included in the TIP, but uh, you know we consider those to be very important projects. And so we include the uh, locally funded projects from our three counties, uh, city of Orlando, uh, city of Kissimmee, and other uh, smaller municipalities that have responded to our request to uh, show their locally funded projects in the TIP. And then we also show Central Florida Expressway Authority. Uh, they, of course, uh, uh, publish their own five-year work plan, and we include that in our TIP for information purposes. So we try to cover as much as we can, uh, includes uh, both federal, state, and locally funded projects. I hope that answers your question. Thanks, Keith. Um, we have another, it's a location specific, but it refers to transit. I was, I'm gonna ask Ms. Sarah Larson if she would come on for this one. Um, the questioner um, asked about a bus stop at East Central Boulevard and Lake Avenue and wants to know if, if that's on the list for, um, for the bus stop improvement? I think Miles actually might be better off. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to pass to Miles. Sure. Okay. Um, so I believe the stop that's in reference happens to be a, a limo bus stop in downtown Orlando, unless I know we have a lot of centrals and lakes, but I think that's the one we're talking about in, in this instance. Um, I don't know specifically if that's on our, our upcoming plan uh, to, to add a shelter and or bench to, but um, I made note of it and I'll, I'll get back with, with our, our team members that actually do work on the prioritization of our bus stops. Um, it's one of the factors that would go into that could very well be, you know, the ridership um, and plans for future service in that area. So we do have, we do have an obligation to maintain any shelter installation for, for a number of years because we do use federal funding for them. So it has to depreciate before uh, we remove or if we relocate, we have to you know make sure it is in functional condition and it is reused somewhere else. So those are just some of the things we factor in that, but for that that Central and Lake Ave, uh, I've made note to, to share with our team members and see if that's on the list. Okay, thank you for that. And um... Then we have a question, uh, and this is about a, a project in Osceola County. So I'm going to be calling on Tawny again, but it's the um, Boggy Creek Road expansion near uh, Narcoosie Road. 
um, the uh, questioner would like uh, an update about how, how that is going and what the plan is for traffic management there. Sure, um, <clears throat> thank you for the question. Yet the Boggy Creek, the expansion from Narcusi to Simpson is under design now and is funded for construction. So we'll start right of way acquisition by the end of this year and construction on the roadway um, is set to um, start by the third quarter, fourth quarter of 2023 calendar year. Um, and up to date information on plans um, and all of our road widening projects can be found on our website, which is osceola.org backslash uh, roads. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the update. Um, we are we are out of the time that we had allotted for questions um, at this point, and we have a couple of questions still in the queue. But um, hopefully, we can get back to these questioners. Um, but we do want to allow a few minutes here to for public comment. This is the. Um, this is the time for, for your comments um, when you can just register your opinion um, uh, live for us. And uh, we would like to hear from you if you're ready to do that. Um, to make a public comment in this meeting, um, please use the raise hand feature. Uh, it's a button on your toolbar at the bottom. And uh, when your name is called, your microphone will be unmuted. If you are joining us on the phone only, you can press star nine to do that. Um, when you get the prompt to un unmute, um, then you can make your comment. We would ask that you state your name um, and uh, contact information for the record. And uh, we are limiting these comments to two minutes. Um, if you are not ready to make your comment or you don't wanna make it here or you don't wanna limit it to two minutes, uh, we will receive your written comments, uh, as I said, through Wednesday, June 23rd at our comment at metroplanorlando.org email box. Um, and uh, you, can, you can send those to us. Um, the, the public comments are just that. They are comments. Uh, they are not questions. We will not attempt to, to address or explain your concerns, but, but we are listening and we will share this with the Metro Plan Orlando board um, before they make their final decision on this transportation improvement program, which will happen at their July 7th meeting. And so with that, I do see that we have um, two hands raised. And um, the first is uh, Joanne Canellis. And so if we can unmute Joanne. Hello. She's here. Yes, I'm here. Make, please make your comment, Joanne. Yeah, yeah. this is Joanne Canellis. And I, and I live in um, um, 324 Country Club, I mean, um, Claremont Avenue. Lake Mary, Florida, 32746. Yeah, if you need 24 hours train and bus service, including holidays, nighttime, and weekends, and stuff like that. And I like to have my, the bus stop over at the um, Estella Road, which is a country club road. That's the corner of Estella Road and Country Club Road here. Yeah. So, yeah, because you, get, you can put the bus from, um, train station all the way to um, Seminole State College and stuff like that, so I don't have to walk so far. And we need a bus uh, every half hour as well. And we need a bus over at the Oviedo Boulevard where the bus stop is, including the Big Kahuna, Big Kahuna swimming pool area. So we like to go to swim at now on Saturdays as well. We need to train on weekends and holidays and bus uh, every half hour and weekends and holiday as well, bus 45, 434, and stuff like that here in all in Seminole County. Please, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joanne. And, uh, and then we have a question from uh, Mr. John Puhek. So if we can unmute 
uh, Mr. Puhek, I believe. Are you ready to speak? Mr. Puhek, I think you are unmuted if you can make your comment. Okay. Um, 4881 Cypress Woods Drive, uh, 3110 Orlando, Florida, 32811. I live very close to Shingle Creek Trail by Millennia. I have uh, uh, seen a great uptake in uh, usage during the pandemic uh, between students and uh, uh, just senior citizens uh, walking it, uh, uh, average workers taking it to work, um, and uh, very excited about the extensions up to uh, Raleigh, that uh, that will help out the students, and uh, extension south. That's uh, something that uh, a lot of the uh, condo users and uh, um, apartment uh, residents in the area uh, uh, use. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Puhek, and, and um, I do not see any other hands raised at this time um, for public comment. Again, please, please share your thoughts with us at comment at metroplanorlando.org. We will be accepting those through the close of business on June 23rd and sharing each and everything you say with the Metro Plan Orlando board. Um, if, if you have questions that weren't addressed here or you want more information, um, we are here, either in person or virtually. Uh, some of us are, are in both places. And uh, someone's telling me my time is up. No, I wanted to show you first the how to contact us. Uh, here are the email addresses of the presenters that you heard from today. So uh, if you have specific questions about their presentations, um, please reach out. You also see my contact information. If you have a, a question for me, please reach out. Also, if you would like for us to, uh, to get some more information to a group or something that you belong to, we will be happy to do that and you can reach out to me. Um, so that's our time. It's, it's one o'clock and we appreciate your taking, taking this time to be with us uh, at our first ever lunchtime TIP public meeting. And with that, um, I think we are finished here. Thanks again.